So it's going now. So welcome to everyone uh, here in the classroom, by Zoom, online later. And I'm sorry to say, we just prayed. And uh, I always like to uh, pray uh, here on the video so that others who join us later will be able to pray with us. But uh, we just finished praying and forgot to record it first. So here is a, a, a brief summary of uh, chapter 18 that we covered last week. Uh, we've seen this theme repeatedly in John's time. Rome was the latest Babylon to rule on earth. There have been Babylons before and there have been Babylons after. There are still, still Babylons today. There are still empires today that uh, oppose the work of God to oppress God's people. So at that time, it was Rome. Uh, and we are in this world and we live in these empires and are affected by the Babylons of today, but we're not of this world. Uh, not only there in Revelation 18, 4, but John 17, Jesus saying, keep them. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I'm asking you to be with them and be, be with them through the valleys that they go through in this world. Uh, but be of, be of good cheer. The last verse in chapter John chapter 16. In this world, you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. But, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So be encouraged by that. That we follow the Lamb who has overcome by his own blood. And then a rule that we see about empires with all of the 30 or so descriptions of, of the goods that the Roman Empire traded in, uh, mentioned at the last, was the trap. They trafficked in the bodies and souls of people. And empires will always do that. They're still doing it today. And we have it going on around us. Again, Houston being a hub of sex trafficking in, in this part of the nation and, and the state. Uh, more, more slaves today than at any point in history, 30 million plus slaves. Uh, that they, as close as they can estimate in, in our world. Empires always traffic in people, bodies of people, using them either for sex slaves or work slaves, children, uh, older people in sweatshops. Um, so God is always concerned about justice. Now, in treating and how people are treated. Now, one thing that I uh, as I was doing some further study, uh, I should have gone through this uh, material that I had from Gene Peterson earlier. And so I, I want to just share one insight. Uh, look, turn to Revelation chapter one. I know we're going to be in 19 tonight, but look at Revelation chapter one. And what are the what are the first five words? How does it begin? What, is it, what does it say? The revelation of Jesus Christ. And Peterson makes the good point. Not the revelation of who we may think the Antichrist is. Not revelation of uh, when the second coming will be. And these things that we, love to, we, we may love to speculate about. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, I will then at that point pull up the Kindle version here in uh, Peterson's book as Kingfisher's Catch Fire. It's sermons of his through his 40 years or so of, of, of teaching ministry and on uh, you know books of the Bible going all the way through. But I know it's a little small there for you all to see. Uh, but look at the highlighted section here. We learn more about worship from Revelation than from any other single place in the Bible. It is permeated by singing and praise, quiet and vigor, and our imaginations are stirred to recognize the invisible come into, into visibility in a relational community. All our senses are involved. We see things we 
never had eyes to see before. We hear voices that enter into and permeate our inner lives. The world around us becomes alive with meaning. Everything means something, especially here in Revelation, so symbolic. There are voices, pictures, animals, angels, and we are not just onlookers. We are participants. Worship is participatory. There are no bystanders. Something is done. We are involved. And it is just a good point that there is more worship in the book of Revelation than just any other single book that we have. It makes the note that really the first seven chapters are pretty much just infused and permeated with worship from the throne room scene in chapter four, Jesus, the whole first three chapters, Jesus, and among the churches, uh, there is five, the lamb opening the scroll, six, the scene in heaven, seven, the lamb with, with, uh, with all of his sheep. And so, and then you get into eight through 18 or so where we were last week, even uh, 19. And there's a lot of, you know, fearful and frightful images, but it, it is sandwiched between worship of God. And even in those dark chapters of all of the the repetition that empires will be empires and they will oppress. That's a simple message from it. That even in the middle of that, chapter 14, there's worship again. There's the Lamb with all of his followers. So I just really appreciated that that synopsis of the book. It's a book about worship of God in the midst of in the midst of difficulties in this life, in the midst of nations and empires that we find oppose God and his ways. And yet we're called to worship. Uh, uh, this is where uh, I mentioned the, the, just this little highlighted section, worship God. The introductory sentence in Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not Revelation about the end of the world, not the identity of the Antichrist, but the centering and recentering act of each and every day, worship God. And that's what you and I need to do. That's what helps calm and center our lives in the midst of tumultuous times, uh, is that in some small way, every day, we need to worship. We need to be still before the Lord. I pray that for all of us, it's not a matter of uh, us just thinking of going to worship on Sunday. And then that's all. We need, in a small way, every day, be on our knees before the Lord, to talk with him through the day. But that is the centering act of our lives. And that's what calms us in the midst of chaos, is, is that act of worshiping and being centered on God. Uh, <clears throat> let us, let me check one thing. <clears throat> Metzger's book will mostly be uh, when we are in chapter 19 here. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice will, will come back. Uh, I want us to repeat yet again uh, a little bit of the end of 1718 and then go on into again just hearing the first bit of well, all through uh, chapter 19. Uh, if you recall, uh, we've had the, over here, we've had the, the sevens, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, empires being empires. And so, and by the end of, uh, but, you know, get to 17, uh, the unveiling opening of the scroll from chapter five is finished. And he repeats in 17 to the end, the fall of Babylon, the final battle and the marriage of heaven and earth. So the fall of, of Babylon again is where we are. The details, symbols, symbols, they would be very clear to John's first readers. He's personifying the military and economic power of the empire.
but he's also doing more. In this vision, John has blended together words and images from every single Old Testament passage about the downfall of ancient Babylon, Tyre, and Edom. John showing how Rome is simply the newest version of the Old Testament archetype of humanity in rebellion against God. They come together and form nations that exalt their own economic and military security into a false God. This isn't something limited to the past or the future. It's a portrait of the human condition throughout history. And Babylon's will come and go leading up to the day when Jesus returns to replace Babylon with his kingdom. But how will Jesus' kingdom come? Up to this point, the day of the Lord has been depicted as a day of fire or earthquake or harvest. And now it's depicted as a final battle and it's told twice. It results in the vindication of the martyrs. Now John takes us back to the sixth bowl where the nations were gathered together to oppose God. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears. He's the great hero. He's the word of God riding on a white horse and he's ready to conquer the world's evil. But pay attention, he's covered with blood before the battle even begins, and that's because it's his own. And his only weapon is the sword of his mouth. It's an image adapted from Isaiah. John's telling us that Armageddon will not be a bloodbath. Rather, the same Jesus who shed his own blood for his enemies now comes proclaiming justice. He will hold accountable those who refuse to repent of the ways that they participate in the ruin of God's good world. And the destructive hellfire that they've unleashed in God's world justly becomes their own God-appointed destiny. After this, John sees a vision of Jesus' followers who have been murdered by Babylon, and they're brought back to life, and they reign with the Messiah for 1,000 years. Then after this, the dragon who inspired... Well, because we get to 20, we're going to a few verses of, of 20 tonight, but not uh, that far into uh, chapter 20. And so we'll be focusing more on... Uh, 19. And so if you would go ahead and uh, there'll be a few things that we get to there. In the meantime, let me just leave it right there. Open up to 19. And even though we covered the first five verses, uh, what we want to see, remember uh, in, uh, you know, as you come to this hallelujah chorus in 19, remember the word there used it's the only time in the English Bible where you have hallelujah used in the Old Testament Psalms. It's translated more into praise the Lord. But here we have kind of a the, the direct form of it, hallelujah. And so it's one of these great choruses of praise. It is this worship again. Uh, let me double check, chat, make sure it's not uh, good. Uh, no one's saying that you cannot hear, so I'm glad for that. Uh, that ends kind of the reign of evil, 19, we'll deal with kind of the final judgment uh, on, on evil, but let's just not overlook the praise that it begins with there uh, in 19. So let's go ahead, listen uh, to 19, up to the first few verses of of chapter 20. So it should be chapter 19. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven. The sound is really bad. Thank you for letting me know. So it's it's very distorted. You can't hear it very yes, well. Sir. Yes, sir. 
All right, let me tell me if this is uh, any better, just directly here. That was, we were up to uh, verse, yeah, about verse seven, let us rejoice and be glad how much more uh, enough. So Vivian, stay on and, and just let us know if you can hear me. to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the mighty of horses and our riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Chapter saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He, with the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, and locked and sealed it over him, to keep him from deceiving the nations any more, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. And we're going to stop there. Because we won't go any further than that the text that is the uh, the text that we have to cover tonight through uh, verse three, chapter twenty, verse three. Uh, with that, then the first part being distorted, I'm assuming that you can hear me okay now. That um, the rest of this is is okay. So just let me know if you have any problem with uh, with the audio right now. No, you're good now. Thank you. Oh. All right, thank you, Vivian. Um, and so it's again important to get the context. Uh, numerous times in the chapters uh, 8 through 18, evil has tried to overcome. They've mounted these attacks, but against God, against his people. And yes, they kill some but they are never able to overcome the lamb. And uh, that's important for us because that number one, that we do see that in the history of Israel. <clears throat> Again, we've talked previously about other Holocaust attempts on God's people in chapter 12, where he tried to devour the woman who would give birth to the, the Christ child, to the Messiah. Uh, but again and again, the evil one and his false prophets, these, these, some of them charismatic leaders, 
they are not able to overcome. Deceive some, yes. Lead some in rebellion. Uh, but they never overcome lamb. And so you get the hallelujah praise here in 19, those first five verses. And uh, notice the 24 elders making a showing again, 19.4. 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down in worship. That was from, from uh, chapters four and five. Uh, then in verse six, I heard what sounded like great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, loud peals of thunder and shouting. Uh, hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice, be glad, and give him glory. So calls to worship. We, we see these calls for worship here in Revelation. We need to be heeding those calls to worship in our own lives, our daily lives. Give God the glory, worship him, rejoice and be glad. And again, the context, rejoice and be glad in the midst of difficult times. Yes, uh, James, James 1, 2, and 3, consider it pure joy when you encounter trials. Paul, Romans 5, 3, and 4, uh, rejoice in your suffering. Uh, so yes, even in the midst of difficulties, rejoice and be glad. Give God the glory. For the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So when we, that, that's, that's so interesting to have the wedding there, the wedding of the lamb. And of course, we know about the great wedding feast at the, at the end of time when Jesus, the groom, is united with his bride, the church. But think about John. Uh, we're going to go with the... Uh, you know, the, the view that many have had through the years that this is written by the Apostle John, wrote the Gospel of John, the letters, and, and uh, Revelation. So what does John open up with, uh, you know, in, in his Gospel, in John chapter 2? What's one of the first signs that Jesus did was at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, and where he turns the water into wine. Uh, so John begins his gospel with a wedding, the feast, and here at the, at the end of, nearing the end of Revelation, uh, here's another wedding, this one. And Jesus was at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Here he's at this wedding feast at the end of time. Uh, the resurrected Lord, not, not just the incarnated Jesus, but now the crucified, resurrected, risen Lord. And the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Well, that's just full of meaning for us. The bride, the church, has made herself ready. That's what we are in the process of doing. As we live in two kingdoms, the kingdom, a kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God, we, we, that's what Revelation has been about, the people of God learning to be faithful, learning to live faithfully in the midst of empires that oppose God, uh, in the midst of societies that try to draw us away from God. Our task as followers of the Lamb is to keep ourselves ready, to be uh, like the five wise virgins who were ready. Uh, we are making ourselves ready. Jesus will come for his bride, a pure church. And that doesn't mean people who consider themselves morally superior to others, but people who faithfully follow Jesus and are cleansed by his blood, First John. So you go to John and his other book, First John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son cleanses us from all sin. So the bride, as the bride, we're, we're being made clean, not just by our own moral efforts. Uh, yes, we need, to, we need to work to remain pure, but it's, we're purified by the blood of Jesus. And here, the wedding of the lamb, his bride is made ready. Our righteousness is that from Jesus. The wedding garments that we get are white because 
They're cleansed by the blood of Jesus and not just by, again, our own efforts. Uh, we must partner with him. But it's just such a beautiful image and picture here. John beginning the gospel with a wedding, talking about a wedding here of the Lamb. The time has come. Verse, uh, verse 8, fine linen, bright and clean, was given uh, to the bride to wear. Uh, let me get here to... Oh, I had wanted uh, just a, a couple of things as we just pause in that action right there. A couple of things that I had uh, wanted to share. We noted from Peterson about worship. Uh, uh, and so here as the bride of the lamb. So Metzger points out well, the concept of the relationship between God and his people as, in, as marriage goes far back into the Old Testament. Again, and again, the prophets spoke of Israel as the chosen bride of God, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea. And so this imagery that we are, that Israel was a bride to God, we are the bride of Christ, the groom. So it draws on Old Testament imagery. And we mentioned John, so I, I still need to get those numbers, but 404 verses, I think, in Revelation, and there's over 500 allusions to Old Testament scripture. John loves the most uh, Exodus, Ezekiel, and Daniel, but there's not a hardly a single book in the in the Bible, the canonical, uh, especially Old Testament, but even into the New Testament that he doesn't reference uh, and allude to, and so you see it here. But you get to uh, 19, uh, Metzger helps us by saying the tempo of the action here increases uh, where we know the outcome will be the defeat of evil. Uh, and so from here in 19, verse 11, where I saw heaven open to the first verse of 21, we have in rapid succession seven visions that prepare for the end. Uh, each beginning with the words, I saw. Uh, and uh, then we will come back and see something very significant here uh, in, just, in just a moment. So the wedding of the Lamb, a fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. But again, it's not us saving ourselves by our own righteousness. Uh, Paul will say in Philippians 3 that uh, I count everything, all of his credentials as being rubbish in view of knowing Christ, being clothed, not with, not with his own righteousness, not a, Pharis, a Pharisee's righteousness, but the righteousness that comes by faith uh, in Christ. And those are, those are our garments as we partner with him. So in verse 9, 19.9, the angel said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. He added, these are the true words of God. So there's the wedding again. We're, we have that to look forward to again. <clears throat> Maybe adjust some of our images of what afterlife will be like, not just somewhere up in the clouds, kind of with maybe spirit, nobody. We have a feast to attend. There will be real food. There is this wedding banquet of the Lamb. I look forward, you know, to that tasting, smelling, uh, even better than now. Blessed are those. This is the fourth blessed. We know that Jesus uses in the Beatitudes, blessed. He has nine blesseds in the Beatitudes. John uses eight blessed. I think I earlier said seven, but a total of eight blessed. Uh, here in Revelation. And uh, blessed are those who were invited. Uh, and that this was an angelic being in verse 10. I, John, fell at his feet to worship him. He said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you. And with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus, worship God. Uh, so there you have it again, worship here in the book of Revelation, just rich and thick throughout, and it's worshiping God, not the empire, not things in this world that we love, 
If we love the world and the things of this world, the love of God isn't in us. So we, we have to worship God because we know we have a, a, a great capacity to worship other things. We can worship ourselves, narcissistic. We can worship shiny things, technology, or, you know, our families. There's a multitude of things that we can worship. But here he says, worship God. No, you know, no celebrity worship allowed. We can, we can elevate celebrities in our culture. The angel says, I'm a fellow servant with you. It's just like Hebrews 1. I think it's 14, are not angels, ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. It says, worship God, not me. And I think that's significant. Only God, no angel worship. Yes. Yeah. Which, what does? Oh. That's good. Miguel just making a point. See it again in chapter 20, where he bows down and is told not to. When Peter went to Cornelius' house, Cornelius bowed down to worship Peter. Peter said, No, I have a, a man just like you, uh, just our tendency, our propensity to worship. And and Miguel said, you know, we can maybe worship a pastor, but we should always keep our perspective straight what is you know hebrews 12 after the 11 chapter 11 is the great hall of fame of faith chapter 12 fix your eyes on jesus the author and perfecter of our faith so you know only worshiping god through jesus christ and so yeah appreciate that miguel that's we need that reminder worship worship god only and Paul will talk about in Colossians, uh, worship of angels. And, you know, that's, that's forbidden. And we don't need to get, you know, all caught up in angelology, study of angels or fascination where they're just ministering spirits. They, they help us in our journey. Uh, and then 11, verse 11, 1911, and we referenced this one last week. I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. So this is the, there's some other I saw here in, in 19, but turn back real quickly. Just keep your place there. Turn back real quickly to 4.1, chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, and you have, after this, I look. And ever before, was the door standing open in heaven. He just heard Jesus saying, you know, I stand at the door not. There's a door standing open in heaven. <clears throat> so it's like he sees the open door, you know, but he doesn't see the full picture, the full revelation. And he goes on to see more, but then go to 11. I'll get that later. Uh, in 11. And uh, sorry, I have to. Go eleven nineteen. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within its temple was was seen the Ark of the Covenant. So he sees the open door. Now he sees like into the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant there. So eleven nineteen, and then flip that around nineteen eleven. I saw heaven standing open. So it's the broadest view yet from the door, from the open door, 
to the Holy of Holies, and now I see John sees heaven standing open, and the white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. So Faithful and True juxtaposed against descriptions of empires, you know, the beast, the dragon, the beast, the false prophets. They were not faithful and true. They were deceiving. Remember the frogs, uh, the demon frogs, the lying voices that empires advertising can speak to us. So they're not powers of this world of these empires are not faithful and true. Jesus, he is both faithful and truthful. What is he saying? John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, and with justice, he judges and makes war. Now, it's significant what we see here, 12, his eyes are like blazing fire on his head. On his head are many crowns. Previously, the, uh, in, uh, in 17, the woman on the beast, uh, if you, you know, in 17.3, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast was covered with blasphemous name that had seven heads and 10 horns, uh, and there were crowns. Well, here, it's even, it's more with Jesus, has many crowns. Uh, the one, the only one worthy to receive all worship, many crowns. But notice, of course, with Jesus, the cross came before the crown. So that's a fact of life with us. Our cross, he calls us, Matthew 16, 24. If anybody would come after me, let him do what? Deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. So even for us, cross before the crown, we like it the other way around. We, we like crown, maybe even no cross, or at least a sanitized version of the cross, but it just doesn't work that way. It's the cross and then the crown, and he has been on the cross. Here we see him, faithful and true, many crowns, has a name written, no one knows, but he himself. And in 13, he's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. Uh, but that's what's significant, and we've covered it before. But before the battle, he's already his robe is already dipped in blood, and as the video said, not blood of the enemies, but his own blood. And Metzger helps make that uh, that point here, uh, this highlighted. But here, John reshapes the imagery to portray the gospel of Christ, who triumph by shedding his own blood. We see that back in chapter five or six, he, the first time little slain lamb, Arneon was used, uh, following Christ of the armies of heaven on white horses. And instead of wearing armor, they're clad in fine linen, white and pure. Uh, and so that's significant because it's, it's not, they're not dressed for battle in the, the way the world does battle. But here they are in fine white linen, indicative of the way that we wage war. It's like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons of our warfare are not those of the world. You know, destructive, violent weapons. Uh, and so here they are, here his followers. Uh, 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on horses, dressed in linen. This is all symbolic imagery. Remember symbolism. Uh, symbolism in 15, when the mouth, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. Uh, that is imagery again, not literal. And we've already covered what is the sword. Word of God from Ephesians 6, putting on the armor of God. Uh, take take this, you know, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus overcomes by his word, even as he did in the in the desert temptations in Matthew 4, Luke 4 with the devil. Each time he was tempted, his reply was, It is written, it is written, it is written. So he overcomes 
with the word of his mouth. John, you know, in the beginning was the word, word was with God. Uh, so on his 16, on his robe and on his thigh, has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, that's significant. That's not just there, uh, you know, for window dressing, uh, because they're in this empire. Caesar's claiming to be the ultimate authority, to be king, lord, all of those titles used for them. And here is the one, faithful, true. He is truly the king above all kings, lord of lords. So what it should do for us today, just like it did for the people that were listening to John, be reoriented on Christ. Truly know that he is Lord. The, the rulers of this world are not God. You know, nations are not God. Empires are not God. Jesus, you know, represents God. He is God. He is the one that deserves worship. King of kings, Lord of lords. So, that helps to again center us and focus us in this in, in the world that we live in. Uh, 17 angel standing come um, again, symbolism. Uh, 18 feast on the flesh. This is, you know, there is not a literal battle here. Uh, Jesus covered with his blood before it begins. 19. I saw all the beast, kings of the earth, their armies gathered to make war against the rider. But it's like there is no battle. 20, the beast was captured within the false prophet. Those who performed those back from chapters uh, previously, the beast, the false prophet, uh, the ones that had deluded with who had received the mark of the beast, worship his image. So we still, we talked about that in our world today. Uh, if you don't bow down to the right powers, you can't uh, even buy from shops, some of our brothers and sisters, whether, you know, in Laos, uh, in so many other countries, in North Korea. And uh, the two of them, there in 20, were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. 21 finishes. Uh, the others were, were killed. But again, we have to keep in, keep in mind the overall picture. Again, not in what we're seeing here is not a literal battle. Uh, Metzger helps on this. Just saying here, all of this is symbolism at its highest. No one imagines that such, a state, that such statements are literal. We won't see white horses or the sword projecting from the mouth of the conqueror or the birds gorged with the flesh of fallen warriors. The descriptions are not descriptive of real occurrences, but of symbols of the real occurrences, that evil will be defeated and Jesus will triumph. The message is that John conveys through his symbolism is that evil will be overthrown. Here, the message is presented in apocalyptic pictures of almost repellent realism. The, the gory images of birds gorging on flesh. Uh, and here it says it's, it's noteworthy that the victory is won by Christ's word alone without any military help from the faithful. His word, the sword, the word of God from his mouth. Uh, this contrasts with other apocalypses like of uh, during the Maccabean period where it always involved military violence. Uh, and so when you get to the dragon, he says, having related the destruction of the beast and the false prophet, John now turns to the ultimate enemy who deceived the nations, identified by four sinister names, the dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil, or Satan. And so look at that in the 20. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his 
and a great chain. He sees the drive, and here's where you have it stated four different ways. The dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, bound him for a thousand years. To remain in the abyss, like and covered and sealed it, to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore, till the thousand years were ended. After that, set free for a short time. So uh, there you have uh, this mention of the, the thousand year period, and of course, a lot of uh, discussion and disagreement by different believers through the centuries. Well, what does that refer to? And so you get into the millennial theories, premillennialist, postmillennialist, amillennialist. Uh, one of the messages that is clear and is stated here. Uh, uh, yes, we can go ahead. Uh, let me just start down here at the bottom on this. Here, the unholy trinity will be tormented day and night forever. Satan's rule is now completely and absolutely finished. His world age is ended forever. Such is the account of the thousand year period in, in chapter 20 of Revelation, the only place in the Bible that mentions the millennium. The word millennium, Latin term, means thousand years. Over the centuries, diverse interpretations have been built on these few verses. Commentators have read into John's account, ideas from other parts of the Bible, such as rapture, tribulation, reconstruction of the Jewish temple, none of which are mentioned here. Uh, and then these elaborations fall into three principal schools, uh, post-millennialists, pre-millennialists, amillennialists, can make this available for later. But let's don't miss the point. Despite different views on it, each of these interpretations involves various difficulties, but the central truth of all three is clear and direct affirmation. Christ will return as he promised, John 14, 3, and will destroy the forces of evil and establish God's eternal kingdom. And so that is helpful because no one person is going to solve for everyone the issue of the millennial question. It's been going on for a couple of millennium now, 2000 years since John wrote this. There's not going to be complete agreement and it's okay. It's not a self, what one believes about the millennium is not a salvation issue. But let's not miss the point that what it is saying, regardless of which view, Jesus will return he said there in John 14, I'm going away, and if I go, I will come back. He will return, and he will deal with evil. It will be, justice will be dealt. And so, you know, let's unite on that truth under the Lordship of Christ, in spite of maybe different uh, perspectives on the millennium. and. And, and at least take comfort from that because we can't know beyond the shadow of a doubt, whether it's pre, post, off, you know, no millennium. But we can know the, the truth that gets repeated over and over here in Revelation. The enemy tries, he mounts his best effort. Chapter 12 is trying to consume Israel and not let the Messiah be born, but he fails. He fails, he fails. And it doesn't seem like he's failing in our world today. Evil seems, uh, you know, pretty mature. And, and that is a truth. One good teacher, I don't, I don't have it right here, but I remember clearly because it really impacted me a number of years ago. I read that as time continues, both evil, and good mature. So as time continues, yes, evil will only become more evil. Its fruit matures. But with the kingdom of God, its fruit continues to mature. The kingdom of God is light, not darkness. It is love, not hate. And as that love, as that fruit matures, we see it in our world around us. 
And we just have to be careful as the people of God not to fixate on the fruit of evil that is material. Because you can pretty well get it from the main news sources, uh, headline news. And again, I always pray that, that that's not all that we feed on. Because they're not out there to tell us the good news of what God is doing around the world today. That's just not their business. There's no money in that. There's no power or control in that. So we're going to hear the bad, but understand, yes, evil continues to mature, but the kingdom of God is growing and spreading too. And it is, it is winning out over hate and darkness, but it's through God's people laying down their lives in the Islamic world, in North Korea and China. And the kingdom of God will continue to spread. And Jesus will return and deal with evil once and for all. So that's the good news. In spite of some of the other difficulties of Revelation and the heavy symbolism, that is good news. And that, and, and keep in mind, too, about Jesus as he appears in 19, covered in his blood. He does battle by the word of God, not by, not by decimating armies. The, the Jesus of the Gospels does not come to Revelation to die and become a bloodletting Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, forever. He is the same Jesus that called us to love our enemies, pray for them, lay down our lives, even as he did. John 13. A new command I give you, love one another. Now, that's not new, but the way he says to love. Even as I have loved you, selflessly laying down my life, even so, you must love one another. And that's how the world is going to know that you're my disciples, by this love that you have for one another. Praying for your enemies, for those who do harm to you. Well, that brings us to the end of our uh, text for the night in thoughts. So, Observations appreciated your input, Miguel. David. Yeah. Heals him. Yeah. 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 David just mentioning now yeah, Peter using a sword there in the guard. Maybe not such a great, great aim. It cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Malchus. Jesus rebukes him. No, my followers will not wage war that way with the sword. Uh, and so he's consistent. That's, that, that thought has helped me. Jesus of the Gospels, if we, if we read the Jesus of the Gospels, bring him into Revelation, then some of it begins to take shape and make sense. But it's if you have a schizophrenic Jesus, that is a nonviolent Jesus of the Gospels, and then he is a, a warring, bloodletting Jesus in Revelation, and there's a problem. There's a dissonance. There's, that is an inconsistency that we, we can't really reconcile. But it's not there. It's the same Jesus then and now. All right. Well, we will stop there for tonight, a few minutes early. Have a blessed week, and we'll see you next week. We only have two more weeks, so...